This is the first batch of steel that I got from Dahlonega, Georgia to start making my integral knives. It was some time later before I got the connection. This is a four and a half inch piece of the round bar. This is where I heat it up in a forge before I get started to beat on it. I have an air hammer and it makes things really much simpler. Uh, Without the air hammer, it would be a lot more difficult to get the spread on the round bar. As you can see, it's pretty well evened down all the way. And then once you get it down to the flat bar, then you can start uh, forming a point on it, just like you would if it was a regular flat bar of steel. You continue to forge on it, and then it will uh, start to take the shape of a knife. Uh, this is about the only thing that uh, do a little bit different than the regular flat bar forge welding. The air hammer does make it a whole lot easier. As you noticed, I grip it with two sets of tongs, and that enables me to control it a whole lot better. Go ahead and forge a little bit more on the shape till you get it pretty well close to the shape that you need. If you need to, turn the handle hammer over, and uh, you can spread out the part of the bottom of the edge a little bit. Uh, this hammer that I'm using is uh, one that Butch Seeley made for me. And uh, it's got a diagonal uh, cross pins and works really good in getting this edge on down. When you turn it over, uh, there you go. Turn it over that and it spreads that edge on down a little bit. Then flip it back over to the flat side, and that gets it back flat. I really do like his little hammer. What we're going to do now is uh, swage the, with a little fullering tool I made to make it concentric swages on the, on the handle part. And this will make it easier to draw out uh, the tank. This was tangs a little bit longer on this one than it needs to, uh, but we can cut it off when we get it out too long. This little tool was made by drilling a five sixteenths hole all the way through, and then a five eighths hole close to the center on both sides, and then rounding it out a little bit so that it pinches it uh, and spreads it apart. Uh, so that the, the tang is in the center of, of the bolster. I don't try to hit it real, real hard with the air hammer. Uh, I just, and the air hammer has got quite a bit of control so that it, it doesn't push down on it real fast. Get it all stretched out. After you get it stretched out and close to shape, you can figure out how much too long it is and then you can trim it off so you don't have to be working with that part. I got a piece of 5160 I made a little bar out of to cut them off with, put it under the forge and uh, kind of like a little hot cut, it does pretty good. I don't want to go too far because then it'll mess up my bottom die. Uh, kind of square up the, start to round it up a little bit now using the hit and the square sides. You 
get it pretty close to the size that you want by looking at the first swedging of the of the tang and then try to make the rest of it pretty close to that. The little micarta piece in my left hand there is with the holes in it and I'm trying it out. I have three different size holes for three different size tangs that I use. This one is a 5 sixteenths and what I do is I get her close with a hammer and then I round it up and then I check it and when it slides through uh, then I grind the end of it off a little bit with a 45 because I'm getting ready to put it in a piece of wood block that has uh, a depth in it and then I, that's what I use the hot saw to grind my bolster make it square <clears throat> then I come back behind that and uh, clean it up and that makes it, the bolts are square and perpendicular to the to the tank. And there you have it. And you see the edges have been already rounded off with a with a little grinder so that uh, it comes out right. Clean that all up and then you check it and there you go. It's it's ready to uh, profile and then heat treat. We got a hot stamp it here somewhere. We'll hot stamp it after we get it to shape so I'll know where to put the stamp. When you're using a pattern, always try to use the same one, uh, and that makes them pretty close to all the same size. If you just pick one up that you've already did, well, it may change. Harry Fentress made me the little aluminum tool there where you drop the tang in, it's got a set screw that holds it so that you don't, it makes the handle a lot more bigger. Uh, Put a lot more pressure on it by by using that little grinding aid. Sure comes in handy. As you can see, I put quite a bit of pressure on it when I'm just profiling it. Really, it's not that much steel, but I use most little wore out belts for profiling, trying to get a little bit more life out of them. Just about there. Clean off the sides, get the burrs off of it. Cool it off, turn it off, and we're ready for the next step. And there they are, the pattern and the and the other one. Now we'll put the hot stamp on it. I'll put them in a forge, uh, bring them up just above critical, get a couple of stamps. Got my name stamp and my MS stamp. And put it back in the forge and heat it back up to put the three little teardrops on the other side. It's little, little, uh, stamp I made. Uh, you can make your own stamps too. Just uh, get a piece of 5160 or something and use a little Dremel tool and make it make your stamp. It don't have to be perfect. Uh, it'll last a long time. Once you get it 
stamped on both sides then you need to straighten your blade back out while it's still hot then after this we'll do a couple of thermal cycles watch watch the blade uh, change from a critical temperature and go through the phases back to black uh, first time I saw that uh, I said can you do that again <laughs> all right here we are we got it above non-magnetic checked it out we put it in the old forge here and watch the colors change it'll get kind of dark and then it'll start to get bright again watch out close to the tip and you'll see it start to lighten up there it goes getting bright and this time as it goes through the color change phase then when it turns dark it's it's about a thousand degrees and this will this will is a normalization of the blade which needs to be done about twice at least twice on every blade that you forge uh, it makes it the grain back smaller and it makes it ready to heat treat now if you need to do any drilling tapping or whatever on it you may need to uh, anneal it and you can put that in the oven at uh, 1250 for and let it cool down real slow and then you'll be able to heat treat it or to grind it and drill it and whatever and it doesn't change the grain structure when you keep it below critical I'm using a torch to to heat treat with I got a magnet on the side of my little can there a little tube I've heated the oil up to about 160 to 200 uh, somewhere along in there as long as it's pretty hot uh, it'll cool the steel fast enough I use mineral oil which uh, Carl Anderson told me that's that's what's the best thing to use so I went from my transmission fluid to that and it it really doesn't make any difference as long as it cools it quick enough without shocking it I hold a knife in there about five seconds uh, clean it off uh, it doesn't form any martensite until it gets down to 500 degrees and it doesn't get hard until it gets down below 200 degrees uh, at about 300 or so it's about halfway through 350 uh, I use a heat treat oven to temper with uh, I program it to run about 475 degrees for uh, an hour and a half I ramp it up at a thousand degrees per hour the 475 and I hold it for an hour and a half I do this one time and uh, it's not a complete transformation which is all right with me because it gets 95 percent of it and I figure those five percent are the little boogers that help me cut we're going to do the uh, handle while the while the blades in the heat treat oven I have a little jig that I put in my vise it's, uh, couple little angles welded up and I use a, a drill bit to line it up with uh, so that the, the hole is drilled parallel to the sides or at least the side that's clamped up anyhow and what you do is you put it in uh, it's made out of uh, two angles uh, you bring it over close you pull your drill bit down or end mill down and, and, and lock it to where it will be low enough and then reach over and get a hold of it pull it up again it loosen it up and when it's up again there flat tighten it up good all right now it won't move you back off you come up with it uh, you're ready to start put your blocks of wood in uh, if you have a uh, 
deer horn or something, it has to be done a little different. But the wood is really simple. You clamp it in, figure out where you want to drill your, your hole. You drill the hole, uh, the depth that you need for your, your tank. I have a piece of tape on this that for my stop. When you get done, you, if you have a bunch of them, you can go ahead and do a bunch of them right now. We'll do all the drilling, then you come back and put the end mill on it. You can do all the all the ends of it. And if when you put the end mill on it, tighten it up, and you bring it down to just just touching it, then the end mill will cut a surface plane that is perpendicular to the hole you drill. So that makes it almost impossible to goof up. If you have the tang that with a bolster perpendicular to the tang and then this hole is perpendicular to the, the surface, whenever you put that blade in there, the bolster will match up perfectly every time. You don't have to trim it. Uh, go back and grind a little off this and other, but I mean it is it is right on the money. And what you do is you put your tang in there to make sure that it goes deep enough. If your tang is a little bit too long, you need to pull it off or grind a little bit off of it. Now what I want to do is put a 1 16th drill bit in it because I have a notch in the tang. And I'll put my blade in the vise horizontal, level and even and all that kind of stuff. And then I will move the drill bit over to the notch in the tang. And as I get it moved over, get lined up and move it back into it. And then when it's just right, turn it on. You slide the handle up on, on, the, on the tang, hold it level, and drill. And it will go through that slot in the tank. If you're doing deer antler or whatever, you can do the same thing. Uh, as the only difference is, is making the plane perpendicular to the hole on the antler. But it works perfect every time. Put the pin in, it, it holds it, it's lined up, and we're ready to glue it up. I use pipe clamps, uh, put them in a little vise, pull a pin out, make mix up a, got a little bit of K and G epoxy, uh, already mixed up, uh, put some in, in the hole in the handle material. Swab it around inside, get a good coating inside, and put a little dab on the top, and then coat the tank to make sure it's all sealed up and everything. Fill that little slot up that you ground in the end of it. When you push it in, the air and stuff will blow out the, the little hole, and that makes sure that you get a good solid fill on the inside. Clean it up a little bit, put a pin in it, and then put it in the pipe clamp. And there's my darling. When you, when you put it in a pipe clamp, you have to make sure that the blade is in alignment with the handle. So you look down it, make sure that everything is straight. The blade has been cured for 24 hours. We come up the next day, we take and grind the pins off, make a nice flat surface. We're going to lay a uh, plastic, clear plastic pattern on top of this. And that allows me to see where the pin is and also to line everything up. I could, if the pin comes too close to one of the sides or something, then you can make a slight modification in the angle of the handle to make sure that you, that you don't grind into the hole on the, where you drill for your tank. 
I have a few keepers like that. Matter of fact, the first one of these I made was like that. I use a, one of them little grinders, uh, lay it on there and just go around. It makes it real easy and it keeps it square. Get a little bit on the sides. Get You can't get plumb down to it, but you can get pretty close. And then that gives you the general shape, which uh, makes it close enough so that we get ready to draw our center lines on. And when I say draw our center lines on, we put a center line, uh, line the blade up in the handle and put a center line down it so that whenever we start grinding our blade that we grind to the center line. Sometimes the center line don't always come out in the center of the wood. But if it comes out close, then we can make it work. Okay, now we need to go to the grinder and start grinding on the blade, I mean on the handle. We'll get the handle com pretty well completed before we start grinding the blade. You notice you get a little on one side and then we do a lot on the other because it was it didn't come out exactly in the center. But we got that part ground in and then we just grind in grind in between them and and that makes the handle come out just right. Once we get the, the sides pretty well where they're supposed to be, then uh and we'll start working on the profile again and get the profile down. We'll get the sides all down like we want them. Now we do the profile of the top or the side or wherever. We're getting the top part. Get the corners knocked off. Then you come back and start to round it up, uh, rounding the edges, rounding the sides. Keep keep checking it. Uh, you don't want it try to knock off too much, so you need to watch what you're doing. Once you get to the point that uh, you got it rough ground. Uh, we we'll change it to a, a 120 grit. This is a 36 grit that I'm using right now. I use I love using underneath the belt because I can see what I'm doing, see what it's doing, and it's slack belt, so it doesn't leave much lines. We put the 120 grit belt on to get it smoothed up, and then we'll also start to work on the bolster area and the, and the back of the blade getting it ready for hand sanding and uh, then we go from there. When you go when you go to grind it what I do is I put a little bevel on it 45, 50 degrees whatever and what I want to do is look down the blade to make sure that the, the edge is straight and in line with the center of the knife handle. Once I get that lined up, then I can start grinding the blade. I'm grinding it on a 10 inch wheel. Uh, this is a Burr King with variable speed, so I'm using top top speed on it right now because I want to knock a, a bunch of the steel off. The, the blade has already been heat treated, so I have to be a little bit careful. Uh, don't want to get it too hot. We 
get the blade ground and then I ground the back bevel in it. We also go to a 120 grit from the 36 grit and we'll, turn, we'll probably turn the speed down a little bit. Since this isn't a really big blade, uh, it really doesn't take long to go from the 36 to the 120 and get all the scratches out of it. If you were grinding a lot larger blade, uh, it probably wouldn't hurt to go from an 80 grit next. As you can see, I'm hollow grinding the clip on it, which is about two thirds of the blade, uh, before I get her done, I'll, I'll flat grind it. Getting the handle sanded down, uh, getting all the little sharp edges and lines off of it and scratches, uh, get it running in a direction, get it ready to, to scorch it. Uh, what I do is just use a regular settling torch, uh, get the flame turned down just so that it's not a real hot flame. It's got more kind of a little feather sticking out on it. If you'll notice the long white flame in the middle, it's it's not a real intense flame. Settling is pretty hot, uh, and it it doesn't take very much to, to scorch it. I've used a propane torch. Uh, it's not quite as fast. It's just a little bit different technique. Once we get this done, I put it in some Watco Danish oil with a little bit of uh, walnut stain in it. And then after take it out for a day and then take it out and let it dry, then I put it on the buffet wheel. Buffing wheel, I push it pretty hard, and that takes care of uh, burnishing the, the colors and stuff and uh, smooths everything out. Gives it a nice little smooth, shiny appearance that feels good in the hand. This has been wrapped up to get ready to do a little bead blasting. After the bead blasting, then we'll tool black it. I use a MSC's tool black, a little cotton ball, put it in there and just dip it and wipe it. It's almost instantaneous. It's uh, As long as your blade has been degreased before you bead blast it, it'll, it'll change it very quickly. I use uh, Windex with a little ammonia in it to uh, neutralize it get it all wiped off really good and then I'll put some ballastol oil on it uh, I got a jar there I've been using several years just put a little on the finger and wipe it off and then it don't take but a little bit once we get this done then I'll take it back over to the 8 inch grinder and grind it with a 400 grit belt lines I oil it up and that's done I appreciate your watching it and uh, hope you enjoy the knife